everyone. Welcome to the talks at Google. I'm Tina Lin, country manager of Taiwan, and also Sai Li for Taiwan. Before we start today, a reminder that a recording of today's event will be made available externally on Talks at Google YouTube channel. So please do not discussing anything that is internal only information in the YouTube live chat. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to host today's virtual event. And we have a very special guest, Audrey Tang. Many of you probably already know that as Dig Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey has been instrumental in Taiwan's effort against COVID-19. Since some of today's audience tune in from outside of Taiwan and may not have been familiar with Audrey, so I would like to share a few things I learned about her impressive background. Audrey started learning how to program when she was eight. And by 12, she was coding in Perl, an all-purpose programming language. At 15, she started her own business. And by the age of 19, she already had worked in the Silicon Valley. She assumed office as Taiwan's digital minister in October 2016 and is the youngest ever cabinet member. Audrey is also the first transgender minister in Taiwan and in the world. So we will have time then probably we can come back to this point later. Audrey was tasked with helping government agency communicate policy and managing information published by the government. She is the founder and core member of GAP0. GAP0 described itself as decentralized community that claims to use technology for the public good, allowing citizens easy access to vital information and power to shape civil society. So without further introduction, let's welcome Audrey to share Taiwan's digital effort and contribution in fighting of COVID-19. Welcome, Audrey. Hello, hello everyone. Um, have a good local time, everyone. Uh, and uh, really happy to be here uh, and to, to share whatever you would like me to, uh, to say, really. Uh, I, I wish that there's Dory in this talk, uh, but there's just Audrey, <laughs> just Audrey. Um, the organizer t tells me that there will be no Dory for this live stream. But feel free to uh, really chat uh, however you want uh, on the uh, YouTube live stream. I'm uh, having this pop-up window on the side. Uh, I'm looking at it all the time uh, with my brainwave, I'm sure. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> like, so, so the Dory question was actually from someone um, in from the chat room. So uh, before we begin, uh, I believe Tina have a couple more questions to uh, inquire, to ask me uh, before I launch into my presentation. Yeah, uh, I think that's out of my, oh, and also some of the Google's uh, curiosity is that you are quite famous about your brainwave. So for example, mm -hmm. that every time when the net, net person asks question on internet, even they didn't tag you and even you will find it immediately and answer immediately. So how you think about mm. it and how you can mm. make it possible. Well, I I was able to reply to each and every web forums mentioned about my name because I know this website called Google uh, mm. and I use Google <laughs> both as the keyword alert and I actually already uh, have a tab uh, in the browser that I use, uh, which unfortunately is not Chrome, but Firefox, but anyway, uh, mm. in a tab uh, that uh, shows uh, the new mentioning of my name and the keywords that I'm working on in the past uh, one hour. So I check it like every half an hour and if I can contribute, I just go in and uh, comment. The only problem is that it doesn't index uh, Facebook. Uh, and so I have another tab that shows the latest searched uh, keywords on Facebook because my Facebook feed uh, is removed using a browser extension called Facebook Feed Eradicator. I don't get addicted to Facebook. Rather, I would just do this every half an hour search and again, comment uh, when I can make some contributions. So that's... That's something. Uh, bon Chen said that his Chrome just crashed after hearing me mention Firefox. Uh, that's uh, entirely unrelated. Uh, cannot reproduce here. <laughs> Thanks for kind of clarify our kind of like a Miss Buster by Audrey herself. Yeah. So uh, let's start for today's sharing. And I think everyone cannot wait to hear more from you about Taiwan's effort against COVID-19. 
Okay, definitely. Glad to share. Uh, so can uh, the organizer please uh, project my screen uh, from the uh, StreamYard? There should be a Lego showing. <laughs> uh, and uh, the Lego block uh, is a remix, actually, from uh, Aaron Neongen's New York Times advertisement. Uh, and so this is the main idea of how Taiwan successfully countered the COVID based on the three pillars of digital social innovation. Many Taiwanese people here probably have already heard this slide, uh, but in which case, um, I assure you, this is really short. So uh, just bear with me for another 10 minutes. Um, so the three pillars, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, is about fast, fair, and fun. Uh, and the three pillars taken together improves democracy as more people participate. Digital democracy, of course, remains one of the best ways to improve participation as long as the focus is finding rough consensus and running code, not uh, division, not uh, anti-social media. And so the fast part, Whereas many jurisdictions began countering the coronavirus only this year. Taiwan started last year, last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted uh, locally that there are new SARS cases from Wuhan. Uh, he would got inquiries, eventually uh, punishment from his local police institution. But literally the same day, uh, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, the PTT board, has somebody with this nickname, No More Pipe, uh, reposting that whistleblowing. And our medical officers immediately noticed this upvoted post and issued an order that says all passengers flying from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspection the very next day, and that's the first day of 2020. So this says to me two things. First, that the civil society uh, trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in a public forum, and that the government trusts the citizens enough to tr take it very seriously and treat it as if SARS indeed happened again, something we've always been preparing as a nation since 2003. And because of this open civil society, according to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the most open society in the whole of Asia, uh, and one of the only two in the completely open category in Asia Pacific, along with New Zealand. And we enjoy the same freedom of speech, of assembly, of the press, and so on as other liberal democracies, but with the emphasis on keeping an open mind to novel ideas from the society. And that's why we managed to counter coronavirus without a lockdown, and also counter the infodemic without a takedown. Uh, one example, uh, we have this toll-free line, 1922. This is landline, toll-free number, very simple technology, but it's very powerful. Anyone who called this toll-free number not only gets their question answered almost immediately, more than 90% immediate pickup rate, but also their feedback can get into this daily Central Epidemic Command Center CECC daily press conference the very next day, which is always live streamed thanks to YouTube. And also, we also work with the journalist community to collaborate on new aspects of our counter coronavirus strategy. So one new idea. There was one day in April uh, when a young boy uh, I think his family called, saying that uh, he, the, the boy, doesn't want to go to school because the schoolmates may laugh at him for wearing a pink medical mask. Uh, because when you raise the mask, you don't get to pick the color. And it just so happened that all they get was pink. And the very next day, everybody in the CC press conference started wearing pink medical mask, including Minister Chen Shizhong, our commander, uh, who also said that his childhood hero is Pink Panzer or something. Uh, and so uh, they made sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming. People change their avatars on uh, social media pink. Uh, and this is a, really a social innovation. Uh, it amplified the idea of a uh, mask uh, that protects his good mask. Pink is the hip color. The boy become the most hip boy because only he had the pink medical mask that the hero as well. Uh, and so that kind of fast response really builds radical trust between the government and the civil society. Another focus is fairness. For example, when we ramp up the facial mask production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day, we need to make sure that everybody can get the medical mask equally. Otherwise, uh, the physical vaccine wouldn't work. Uh, and so we utilize the National Health Insurance Card, the NHI card, uh, to collect masks from nearby pharmacies. Fairness is our guiding principle. And GovZero, uh, which Tina just briefly mentioned, played a really large part in what we call reverse procurement. In, in traditional procurement, the government determines what to do, what to develop, and the um, private sector uh, implements it. 
now in reverse procurement, uh, a Google developer group in Tainan, that's a southern city in Taiwan, determined what to do as a society. And Google uh, supports it uh, with Google Map API access, uh, and it demands that the National Health Insurance Agency, NHIA, opens up the open API to power the mask availability map. Not only do we publish the stock level of all the pharmacies, as you can see here, here in the Pescador Islands in Penghu, this particular pharmacy has 58 adult masks in store and 196 children's masks in store. Nowadays, if you go to there, you can collect nine per two weeks if you're an adult or 10 if you are a child. And so we publish this every 30 seconds making sure that GovZero, that's a civic hacker um, initiative, and all the community contributors, all together they built more than 140 tools that enable people to who prefer viewing maps or uh, voice assistants or chatbots, whatever, uh, and they can all see which pharmacies near them still have medical masks. And that made sure that more than 99.99% of citizen residents um, can remain calm and collected because we radically trust the citizens with open data. Uh, people queuing before and after me can make sure that when I do get nine medical masks, this number actually decreased by nine. If this number rather increases, they will call 1922 right there. And so people who show any symptom will then be able to take the mask, go to a local clinic, uh, knowing that they will get treated fairly without incurring any financial burden. This also enables people to make dashboards that lets everybody see our supply is indeed growing tenfold in, in uh, actuality over two months only uh, to 20 million a day. And that's uh, where in Taiwan, uh, up to uh, each uh, precinct, uh, like where do we have an oversupply or undersupply based on the real time feedback by the pharmacist. So we adjust uh, in a uh, weekly iteration our supply and demand uh, curves and strategies that is co created with the whole of society. So one of the independent analysts said that, um, okay, there's a lot of people in the Xinzhu um, Science Park, I'm sure, or, or in the Taipei City or New Taipei City, who systemically did not have access to masks because when they get off work, uh, all the pharmacies have already closed. Uh, and so because of that, and that they don't live with families who can go to the pharmacies for them, they miss the mask collection times. And that um, comprises to around 20% of population. And so that's why we started also also working with the convenience stores. You can see our premier, uh, Su Jun Chang, smiling very happily here. That is because we started working with convenience store a month after we rolled out this uh, pharmacy distribution so that everyone can take the same NHI card and collect your mask anytime, 24 hours a day. And so we ensure fairness of all kinds. And finally, uh, I would like to stress, but because this is a stressful time, people feel anxious and there's a lot of panic buying and conspiracy theories. That's called an infodemic. In Taiwan, our counter disinformation strategy that we have rolled out before the pandemic already is based on the idea of humor over rumor. Humor over rumor, very simply put, is that whenever there's a panic buying, anything that travels on outrage, we would after uh, at most two hours, push a internet meme that is very funny, hilariously funny. Uh, and it, when the fun has a higher R0 value, a higher uh, basic transmission rate uh, than outrage, then people who have laughed about something will not be able to feel outrage. And then people can start talking about the actual facts. For example, when there was a panic buying of tissue papers, there was a rumor that says, quote, oh, it's the same material as medical mask. So the ramping up medical mask production will reduce the supply of the tissue papers, end quote. That's not true, by the way. But people did uh, believe that for a while. And so after only a couple of hours, the same premier you just saw smiling uh, in the previous slide now shows his backside, actually his bottom, wiggling it a little bit, and say in very large print that each of us only have one pair of Botox. And it's a uh, wordplay because it's a homonym. Uh, Botox, twin in Mandarin, sounds the same as stockpiling, uh, so twin. And so uh, basically this internet meme packaged like a tissue paper box uh, says that we don't need to panic buy. And it has the payload, uh, the actual clarification, the fact check that says tissue paper 
came out from South American materials. Medical mask uh, came from domestic materials. These are completely um, different things. And so ramping up production of one do not hurt the other. And anyone who spread this kind of intentional disinformation that hurt the citizens, there are actually the penalty for it. It's beyond the freedom of speech when you intentionally hurt the public. In fact, I think we persecuted um, like three people and they were tissue paper resellers and they were the origin behind that original uh, panic buying uh, disinformation. Uh, but in any case, the idea is that when this goes viral, the conspiracy theory stops going viral. So in just a couple of days, the panic buying is put to the stop. And this is not just a one-shot thing. In each of our ministries, uh, there is uh, a uh, participation officer, just like parliamentary officers that talk to MPs and media officers that talk to the journalists, the participation officers talk to hashtags. Uh, and uh, Gao Zhiheng just ask, why is there a politician in every poster? So you will be happy to find uh, that here there is no politician, just this very cute dog, the spokes dog, Zong Chai, of the Minister of Health and Welfare. You see, the hashtag officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare lives with this dog. So whenever people see something uh, from the CECC press conference, uh, if they had a hard time spreading it, we help by making it an internet meme. So when we introduce, for example, physical distancing, um, the meme says, uh, when you are outdoor, you have to keep two zong chai away from each other. And when you're indoor, keep three shiba inu uh, away from each other. And also, um, uh, thanks, Chris, for correcting my English. Persecuted, not prosecuted. Thank you. Um, and so uh, the zhong chai says, remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Um, and also, remember to pre-order your masks online. Uh, the zhong chai asks you very, in a very cute fashion, but why do you need medical mask? Well, you put on a medical mask to protect you from your own unwashed hands. Uh, and this is very important. This is the meme that really travels because this appeals to people's self-protection instincts and the dog is very, very cute. And this is how we make sure that Taiwanese people still feel calm and collected even during the pandemic. So I only have um, this uh, few slides to begin with. I don't have any more slides, uh, but if you want to check more uh, of the Taiwan model, you can find it at taiwancanhelp.us. And yes, uh, this is the same speed that I speak Taiwanese Mandarin. Um, so is Dina going to be back or do I just start engaging with the YouTube? are from picking up the question from the live chat. So is there any specific question you want to answer first? Uh, definitely. Um, so there's a um, interesting question uh, about uh, whether uh, I like uh, they really want me to run for president. Uh, and <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll just get that out of the way. Um, so um, I'm, I'm nonpartisan. Uh, and the work that I do, which is the same as internet governance, is based on the idea of building common values out of different positions and delivering innovation to fulfill those values. Uh, and so I uh, take all the sides. And that means that uh, I cannot uh, belong to any party. So although I do support a particular party uh, and they're uh, all YouTubers and it's called the Can't Stop This Party or literally the very happy party, Huan Le Wu Fa Dang. But I'm not a party member either. Uh, and so my, my work is just to bring fun uh, and into joy, really, into policy making for everybody involved. And nowadays in Taiwan, it's very difficult to consider um, uh, anyone running for presidential candidacy without any party affiliation. So I'll not run for president. Also, it's unconstitutional. The Taiwan Constitution, rather officially, the Transcultural Republic of Citizens Constitution stipulates that a uh, president needs to be 40 years old, and I'm only in my 30s. But but you are going to uh, over 40 for the next election. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. But uh, I don't know, uh, I don't see how as a post-partisan uh, and a non-partisan really, uh, how that would be possible on a presidential ticket. So no, uh, I'm just going to be the lowercase digital minister. Okay, thank you. So what's mm -hmm. the next you want to answer? All right, so uh, Feng Lam uh, asks, is Taiwan going to build an app using our exposure notification API? Um, the short answer is not yet. Uh, we have not built any contact tracing apps. Um, there's a saying, uh, anything that we're born with is human nature. 
anything that's invented after we're born is technology. Uh, and so to paraphrase, anything that the government does before the pandemic is considered um, fair play. Anything that the government introduced after the pandemic is treated with suspicion. Uh, that is the same in all the democratic countries. And so that's why in Taiwan, for example, when people already get into the habit of receiving SMS message when they are in a uh, area that's going to be impacted by earthquake. For example, I'm just going to show you my phone here. Uh, and that's the the national warning, quake alert, beware of probable shaking, CWB. Okay, so, so that's because I'm in a area that's probably going to be affected by an earthquake. And so this SMS come to me uh, via sale broadcast, uh, I think five seconds or 10, um, maybe seven seconds before the actual earthquake is felt by me, uh, which is really good. Uh, and so people already get into the habit of receiving such SMS. So when we build the digital quarantine system, the digital fence, when people choose to stay in their home instead of the quarantine hotel for 14 days uh, for quarantine, their phone is put into this digital fence system so that when they break out of the 50 or so meter radius based on cell phone tower triangulation, the SMS is sent to not only them, but also their local police. Uh, and so people uh, would get paid 33 US dollars a day as stipend for working with the quarantine. But if they break out as discovered by the digital fence, they will pay us back a thousand times that. They can fund a thousand more people in quarantine. Uh, and so people don't break the quarantine. Uh, and people accept that in Taiwan because they already have experience with the triangulation system uh, based on cell phone tower signal strength uh, on flood warning and earthquake warning. But if we introduce GPS, or app-based, like Bluetooth or whatever-based um, notification API that was not around before the pandemic, then the legitimacy will be much, much lower. And that is why we rely only on technology and repurposing it technology that was around before the pandemic. I hope that answered the question. Uh, and Jamie Zheng asked, why don't you use smartphone? Um, so um, do you have um, something um, against KaiOS? Because this is a smartphone. Uh, this says V O L T E, um, says 4G uh, right here. So, um, and uh, it runs snakes, I'm sure. Uh, but, <laughs> but it also runs um, YouTube. Uh, and the top YouTube uh, that's shown here is Google Pixel 4a. How about that? Uh, <laughs> so, it is a smartphone. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, it is a smartphone if it runs YouTube. Uh, and uh, then it also uh, is, of course, a flip phone. Uh, I like that form factor very much. Uh, and also, uh, most notably, it doesn't have a touch screen. So I don't get addicted to my phone. Uh, I buy this phone because it does not have a touch screen, but it is open source, runs KaiOS, which is the same as the Firefox Gecko code base. Uh, and then um, it's, it's really good. And that's my personal phone. So I don't get addicted to it. Um, all right, uh, and what 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 else? Um, yeah, uh, a lot of similar questions like from Li Pinyin, why the phone is not Pixel? I mean, if you are going to make a Pixel phone that doesn't have a touch screen, I will take it. Uh, but that's your choice, not mine. Uh, okay. yeah, just one, one infomercial that we just uh, launched our new Pixel 4a today. Ah, yes, so but it doesn't it's come, a yeah, touch screen. Yeah, I, I know it doesn't come in a touch screen free um, version. Uh, and um, I mean, I do have a touch screen near me, and this is this um, iPad. And but uh, I treat the touch screen as a non touch screen, I always interact with it only using this Apple Pencil. So um, if you decide uh, to to introduce something with the stylus, I can also reconsider. But if it's touchscreen only, I, I really cannot uh, use it because I, I'll get addicted to it. And that's not good for anyone's mental health, not just mine. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, what else? Uh, Julia Filio uh, would like to know, what's my view of 5G adoption in Taiwan? That's a great question. Um, the 5G adoption in Taiwan is pretty good. Uh, we already have a clean path, which, by the way, we already had in 4G, uh, which is end-to-end -end without PRC-made components. And that's not because we're against any particular vendor. Rather, that is uh, just a realization when we occupied the parliament in 2014 that um, there is no real 
private sector company uh, in the PRC, uh, and if they want, the Dang, the, the party, can always make anything de facto they control over one of their party branches. Uh, I mean, that's what they also say. Yeah, so it's very overt, not covert at all. Uh, and so we have a clean path, uh, and we already deployed 5G, uh, and we got a lot of money from our 5G spectrum auction. Um, and because in Taiwan, uh, if you swipe your national health insurance card, uh, that's uh, you're in the socialist system. Uh, but if you swipe your credit card, you're in the capitalist system. So we have both wings uh, in our society. Uh, and the socialist system, which is uh, broadly speaking, education and health, uh, will use the 5G auction money on the most rural, the most remote places, the digital opportunity centers, the indigenous nations, the remote islands. Uh, we already have broadband as a human right anywhere in Taiwan, even the top of Taiwan, Sabiya, the, the Yushan Jade Mountain, almost 4,000 meters high. You have 10 megabits per second at just 16 US dollars per month, unlimited data connections both ways. Otherwise, it's my fault, personally. Um, but uh, that doesn't translate um, to usage, of course. So we're going to make a lot of sandbox uh, vertical experiments um, that will test the 5G uh, on making sure that, for example, the telehealth, telemedicine, diagnosis, uh, even surgery on ambulance cars uh, and so on, um, gets uh, the funding that they need to develop and that will also test the millimeter wave uh, part of the 5G spectrum. Uh, and that will take place first. So the slogan is the more remote you are, the more advanced you are. And that's our 5G strategy, which is part of our DG plus uh, strategy DIGI, which stands for digitization, innovation, governance, and inclusion, respectively. Um, so what else? Um, Kevin Fu asks, what motivates me to get up every morning? Um, really good question. Um, so um, I, there's a um, fact that I do most of my work in my sleep. So nowadays, like uh, this is daytime, right? So I'm just having fun. I'm optimizing my work for fun. I listen to all the sites. I read the people's ideas, position papers, whatever, um, but do not pass judgment. I, I do not make uh, decisions or interpretations uh, during the day. I'm just having fun. Uh, and then uh, before I go to sleep, I would flip through uh, the materials uh, that really need uh, a common value out of those very different positions um, and come to a uh, common value. So I would do that without sounding the sounds uh, in my mind. Uh, and then I would just go to sleep and with no alarm clock. Uh, and usually after seven and a half or eight hours, I will wake up uh, with a solution, uh, with a common value that can take care of all the sites. Uh, and that motivates me to get up in the morning. But if it's very difficult, like if there's like seven different stakeholder groups, there were um, like long history of, um, you know, distrusting each other and so on, it, I will work longer. So I will work nine hours, that's to say sleep one hour more, uh, and then wake up only when there is a common value uh, in my head. So maybe you can try it out yourself. Um, what else? Yeah, I think uh, the question one is, uh, can you share your thought about how to balance between oh, yeah protection and yeah, pandemic prevention measures yeah right uh actually you can enhance privacy protection uh during the pandemic prevention uh, i'm sure that those of you who work on the notification api uh, which has had a lot of review and feedback on this version one uh, so that on version two it improves on its privacy preserving capabilities understand uh, that during the pandemic there's a lot of people who are very passionate to review your code and your processes so that they become more privacy enhancing and previously expensive or hard to understand or just obscure technologies such as, I don't know, fully homomorphic encryption, uh, differential privacy, split learning, and so on, um, are having a few day because uh, people really care about privacy. Uh, and then uh, there's large amount of people really uh, looking into the available research, and that provides the capability for privacy enhancing technologies to prove uh, to people that it's actually conserving their privacy. Um, case in point, we had a hackathon called Cohack, C O H A C K, dot T W, uh, with a lot of other jurisdictions' teams. And uh, one of the five winners, uh, each winner will receive a Da Tong Dian Guo, a uh, rice cooker. Um, and anyway, which is a symbol of open innovation in Taiwan because it can be repurposed to disinfect medical masks. But I digress. Um, the idea uh, is that uh, people would use this lockboard, which is a app. 
on Google Play uh, and to record their symptoms, their whereabouts, and so on. But it works entirely in airplane mode only, so that it will not transmit anything, uh, Bluetooth or um, you know NFC or Wi-Fi or 5G, 4G, whatever, uh, Morse code, avian carriers, uh, to any other device. Uh, so it's entirely to yourself, like your personal diary. And the only time you share it is if a medical officer come to you to do a interview uh, on contact tracing. And there was one click, you can generate this one time use URL that contains only the kind of information that medical officers truly need because that app is co-created with medical officers without divulging uh, the privacy details of her friends and families as you probably would do uh, in a traditional uh, interview. So this is a logboard that actually protects, enhances people's privacy. And only when the apps uh, feel that they are personal, like in the sense that uh, it serves a fiduciary duty, it's value aligned to you, uh, it's accountable only to you, it serves only your primary interest. As I said, the mask uh, serves your interest because it protects you from your own unwashed hands. It, when the incentive is designed this way, then people come to gradually trust the privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, and so I think the pandemic is a great um, opportunity for us to, who work in the BETs to show our value uh, to the society uh, at large. Those um, so <laughs> Laura Wu uh, network just got crushed. Wonder it's because of the mystery power. Um, again, this is entirely, um, I think, incidental. I do not have any um, Wi-Fi uh, breaking powers. Um, so um, Tina, do you have any uh, favorite question that you would like me to highlight? I, I think there's a few people ask about the, the privacy concern and also security associated with the EID. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's do the EID one. I, I love that uh, question. So um, as you know, um, we're already having a the citizen's digital certificate uh, in which you can uh, make a electronic signature using traditional PKI infrastructure. Uh, we also have a paper-based ID. Uh, which is currently suffering from a problem that it was designed almost 15 years ago now, uh, and the expiry date of the counterfeiting fighting technology, uh, that's paper, a special kind of paper, is becoming out of date. Uh, so it's becoming more and more easy to forge uh, our citizen certificate. Uh, and so the household um, department in the Ministry of Interior came up with this great idea. What if uh, when we're renewing our um, electronic ID, the CDC part, the digital part, and we're also renewing, of course, uh, our paper-based ID, why don't we offer people the choice so that they can glue the two cards together? Well, literally having a uh, citizen certificate that also doubles as a electronic signature uh, certificate. Um, now, um, based on polls, uh, I think around 30% of people think it's a good idea. Uh, the other 30% of people uh, said that they prefer, thank you very much, but to keep two cards. Uh, that is to say one for electronic signature uh, and one for like day-to-day -day, uh, ID, photo ID. Uh, they don't like their digital certificate to have a photo on it. Uh, and another 40% of people um, never use a digital certificate anyway. They just need a photo ID. The good news is uh, for the EID, when you are getting the EID um, next year, uh, we are starting with a, a like opt-in only beta uh, in Penghu and in Xinzhou. When you're opting in, uh, well, you have the choice. You can choose one of the, the three. You can bake the EID into your photo ID. You can get an EID alongside your photo ID, or you can just get a photo ID uh, with no PKI at all in it. Now, um, even with no PKI, uh, the uh, photo ID uh, also contains um, the uh, NFC uh, interface so that uh, it can more easily, uh, in addition to reading the optical characters, uh, which is sometimes difficult to recognize if you have a difficult to recognize name, it would defeat even the best OCR because it's not in uh, the dictionary. Um, but anyway, uh, you can nevertheless uh, record that uh, in the NFC chip. Uh, but then people, of course, worry about the NFC being accidentally read and so on, uh, which is why just like the credit card, uh, we use the backside, like the CVV2 um, numbers. Uh, so it's um, 
a random number, uh, a serial number of each uh, ID. And so when you renew the ID or if you get a new ID or if you just uh, decide to change the number, you can just change the number just as you would for the credit card. And only with that number can people read through NFC uh, your name uh, and your, uh, I think, national ID number. And that's it. Um, and so what what's used to be displayed on the traditional ID, uh, including your household address, the name of both your parents, or whatever, uh, these are gone. These are not uh, printed anymore and it, they cannot be read through the NFC interface. Um, so that's it. Uh, I think people can try it out more uh, during the public beta. We also have a bug bounty program uh, and a uh, for white hat cybersecurity hackers. Uh, so feel free to hack um, the EID while it's being rolled out, uh, I think early next year for six months for purely opt-in beta. And based on the beta feedback, uh, we may also just uh, adjust uh, the um, form factor and so on. So that's it. Uh, Feng Lam asks, uh, is this um, powered by a secure element on the movie devices? Uh, by movie devices, I'm sure that you mean uh, Oh, that's right. Content protection, uh, very important. Yes, the movie playing mobile devices. Um, yeah, of course, uh, we have TFIDO, uh, which is a FIDO compliant uh, counterpart uh, to the citizen digital certificates. It currently only do authentication, uh, not the full authorization yet, but the plan is yes, uh, to um, couple it with secure elements so that you don't have to bring the physical card uh, with you all the time. You can uh, choose to trust your phone uh, instead. So that's it. Um, what else? Uh, a lot of people want me to answer something about TikTok. Yeah, TikTok and also misinformation. So ah, you can okay. start on TikTok first. Yeah, maybe maybe let's do TikTok. Um, so um, the question is that uh, Trump banned TikTok in the US, uh, unless it's, I'm sure, Microsoft TikTok, uh, in which case I think they're still under uh, negotiation. Um, so uh, yeah, in Taiwan, when we talk about the clean path, uh, we really mean uh, throughout the stack. Uh, and so not only PRC companies, but companies that we believe uh, are de facto controlled by PRC, at least in our public sector, as well as our critical infrastructure areas, which, by the way, uh, includes science parks, including the Taiwan Semiconductor Company, um, they're, they're banned. Um, it's just as simple as that. We cannot download and install as public servant software that is deemed by de facto PRC control entities. Uh, and that is also why um, I uh, rely on browser security uh, to connect uh, in a unconnected to uh, intranet uh, device, uh, some sort of video conferencing uh, software uh, and so on. So yeah, uh, I think this is very important that we keep this clean path um, idea across the stack. And in fact, we've been advocating it for six years. When we occupied the parliament, the consensus on the street was exactly that. And then uh, it convinced the National Communication Commission, the National Security Council in Taiwan about that. So so I think it's about time that other countries uh, join our um, idea. We, we try to get out uh, uh, of the PRC control component already uh, in 4G deployment and very successfully, actually. So when we did 5G, there is no past dependency. Um, and so, yeah, the misinformation campaigns. Have you seen the misinformation campaigns using your own human style to reduce confidence in the process? It's not about confidence. It's about making sure the social media is pro-social rather than anti-social. That is to say, if you have seen the movie Inside Out, um, we make sure that people have a larger room, a larger control room in their mind, uh, instead of this uh, knee-jerk reaction uh, with just a few seconds attention and only one emotion can dominate the control room uh, and the memory crystal balls will be colored red and that's anger and outrage. I, I mean, I have nothing against outrage. It's great to highlight a potential social problem, uh, but re you really need uh, a crystal ball that is uh, kind of hybrid color that bridges the anger into joy uh, that can create a new way out of the existing mechanisms that uh, can prevent any injustice from happening again. That is a proper channeling of rage, of social outrage into co-creation. On the other hand, if it uh, becomes um, channeled uh, into hate, uh, that's another inside out character, um, and that will uh, 
of course, go to the toxic way of antisocial social media, where people would go on an expedition, um, in uh, Taiwanese Mandarin, uh, that is to say to attack someone uh, personally or to denounce something uh, as of a lower social status. And that's not constructive because it doesn't actually solve the social problem. So humor over rumor is not about state propaganda. It's not about uh, you having to trust the dog. The dog may, uh, you know, the science facts that a dog offers may change. Because this, after all, is SARS 2.0. It's not SARS 1.0. So one, uh, like many of the uh, early uh, SARS 1.0 um, information that we shared, it's not entirely correct. Once we learn about the asymptomatic, um, you know, people uh, with COVID 19, the N C O V, the N stands for novel, right? Uh, and so. That may change. Science debates may happen, of course, but people do so uh, with uh, this outrage turned co-creative joy rather than outrage turned into hatred and expeditions. And that's the reason why humor over rumor is useful. This is not a state propaganda device. Uh, what else? Um, so, What's uh, your vision for Taiwan over the next five years? So many well, people. This yeah, one. I know, I know. Yeah, it's, it's the literally the most frequently asked question. Uh, and so uh, the answer is actually pinned on my Twitter. Uh, but anyway, um, so, but that's Twitter, right? Uh, so, and we're in YouTube, so might as well repeat that. Uh, would you like to bring the slides? Thank you. So um, for the next 10 years, not just five years, our focus is going to be on the global goals. That's the sustainable development goals. Using digital technology to make sure that the people working on economy, society, and the environment can become accountable to each other. Uh, and in concrete terms, my role as digital minister is to make sure that every sector has reliable data, 1718, uh, that each and every sector, and also internationally, that we have effective partnerships toward those common goals, 1717. And then that we work on uh, the principle of open innovation. When we figure out something in Taiwan, the Taiwan model, we always say made in Taiwan is not just a product, but also the process. When we say Taiwan can help, made in Taiwan, it makes, um, for example, not only the medical masks that we donate across the world, but also the blueprint of how we make those medical masks. Like uh, you can get the blueprint of a uh, essentially automated fact robotic factory that produced 2 million of these per day uh, with some extra material for personal protection uh, materials. Uh, but for the society at large, uh, what will be the effect of these three uh, sustainable development goal targets. Uh, I would say that we will think of digital as um, very different from the traditional linear uh, growth uh, that was the age of information and communication technology as technologies only. Uh, rather, we will look at it as a opportunity to create a new kind of society that is more plural. Uh, and so my job description literally is this poem uh, that I will recite now. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. And when we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's my vision. Thank you, Audrey. And let's see. Um, there, there, there's a one question to ask about. Still go back to COVID nineteen. So, oh, to sure. what extent do you think such a level of a civil engagement can be replicated in the other country or region in APEC? To what mm -hmm. extent civil engagement is driven by the personal relationship, or actually is a systematic factor? Well, I mean, toll-free numbers, um, daily television broadcasts, I'm sure that almost all countries have the facilities uh, to make that happen. So this is not about the level of technology. Rather, this is about how much do you trust your own citizens. And when people trust their citizens, um, then as co-creator, -co then this systemic fast iteration feedback can happen more naturally. And for example, in South Korea, they did not use to ration the mask. In fact, there was very little visibility 
into the availability of medical masks in their pharmacies and distribution channels. And their uh, civic technologists would then uh, look at our medical mask map uh, from Tainan, uh, Google's developer group, uh, and convince their government to start publishing using OpenAPI, um, well, not quite OpenAPI Swagger, the previous version of OpenAPI, um, the API that we need to visualize the medical mask availability. Uh, and so this is what I call reverse procurement. The civil society have a strong mandate, either looking at the Taiwan model or inventing it by their own, for example, in Japan, when Code for Japan worked with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government on the Stop COVID dashboard, we also helped translating them and so on. Uh, and the government can say, okay, we will bless this with the government domain, as we did. Or they can say, no, you keep a distance uh, and we will only uh, publish things on our own accord, on our own tempo, and therefore losing a chance of co-creation. So it's all, I think, uh, in the culture of the decision making. It, it is a systemic factor. I do not think uh, it is about any particular personal leadership, but rather about the system of the hashtag officers, for example, reverse mentorship, reverse procurement. Nothing in it is... Um, illegal uh, in any countries that you mentioned, because uh, in Taiwan, we never declare an emergency situation. Everything that I just mentioned operate entirely within the constitutional limit. So anyone can look at Taiwan can help that us and adopt some of those uh, ideas in the Taiwan model. There's nothing preventing the government from doing so other than maybe their distrust to their own citizens. Thank you. I think that's another question related to, so curious about your thought on creating a long lasting pipeline to motivate hacker to take leap and serve in the government sector. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mentioned briefly reverse mentorship. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, a really good idea. Uh, I myself was a reverse mentor uh, to Minister Jacqueline Tsai, previously of IBM Asia, who served uh, as the minister actually in this very office. Uh, and so I was in this office as kind of an intern, a reverse mentor. Uh, the idea of reverse mentorship is that each minister can hire one or two uh, people who are under 35 years old, who are social innovators with a brilliant new idea, a new direction for the country to go. But uh, doesn't have uh, maybe the resources, uh, the national resources to do so. Uh, and so the reverse mentor would point the new direction while the minister realizes how uh, it can be imbued into the national system of operational um, knowledge. Uh, and so both sides learn, and that's the reverse mentorship. I learned a lot during the year and a half that I served as a reverse mentor to Minister Jacqueline Tsai. Of course, nowadays, I'm over 35 years old, so I have my own <laughs> reverse mentors, but we really scaled it up. Uh, so not only do we have uh, 35 um, people in our National um, Advisory Council of the Youth, uh, more than 25 of them are under 35, uh, and the other um, uh, interns in my office, uh, I think currently we're working with almost 30 people uh, who are under 25, actually, um, around 25, uh, and they look systemically at each and every digital service that the government does and they don't like and fork the government, uh, important pronunciation, fork the government. Uh, and meaning that they make uh, prototypes, they make um, like high fidelity uh, prototypes and mock-offs uh, to show the people a alternate vision. For example, our national hiking portal, hike.taiwan.gov.tw, was uh, initially a intern project. And when they do that, uh, because we have in our procurement law that any existing system integrator and vendor, uh, if they deliver a website, uh, a interactive experience, they have all also to deliver it as an open API. If they don't, um, they could be disqualified. We piggyback on the clause that says, if you make something for people with sight, you cannot uh, exclude people with blindness. So similarly, if you make something with human beings in mind, you cannot exclude robots. Otherwise, you discriminate and you could be disqualified. We don't say uh, discriminate against robots, but that's uh, what we have in our procurement uh, contract template. Um, so the uh, interns vision can always be met with an open API by the underlying services. So when you hike in Taiwan, originally you have to file four uh, different applications to four different agencies. But now the intern just make a simple portal and that would take care uh, of those uh, 
uh, APIs, both read and write, uh, so that you can uh, interact with only one portal. And you can also fork that and make it into an interactive experience and so on. And the beauty of it is that all this front end work does not uh, remove the back end work. So for people who are uh, mountaineers for a very long time, who are already well versed in navigating those old websites, those are still in place. We have no plan to dismantle them, but that enables the young people with new directions of digital service to reimagine things however they want. So systemically, we redo uh, like a dozen or so digital services every year uh, based on this internship, and each ministry can also replicate it, and also each municipality. Thanks for your sharing. I think that's also another one before the talk. I just share with you that in Google culture, we really encourage uh, diversity, equity, and also inclusion as an a, a environment that we, we want everyone to have the opportunity to grow and succeed. So as you see that, for example, for example in the Taiwan society, how you think we can take a part to encourage this type of diversity, equity, and inclusive culture in Taiwan as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the great things in Taiwan is that we have more than 20 national languages, uh, and most of them indigenous. And I myself uh, benefited greatly when I dropped out of junior high school, living in the Atayala Mountains uh, near Ulai. Uh, and it educates me about well, sustainability. They don't need the development targets, right? That's, they've been around for many, many um, uh, centuries. Uh, and so all the different indigenous cultures offer a different insight. And of course, also new immigrant uh, cultures, um, like the Paiwan culture, which is neither matriarchy or patriarchy. Um, the gender simply doesn't matter uh, when choosing um, the, the leader. Uh, and I think uh, our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, is part uh, Paiwan. Uh, and also Ami, uh, which is a matriarchy, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so I would encourage people just to um, I do some migration uh, to immigrate, uh, but it's always just to our strife anyway, uh, and to live a extended time uh, in a different culture uh, and learn another national language. There are, uh, after all, more than 20 to learn from. And then you can look at uh, our culture in a very different way. I used to suggest people to also uh, go um, abroad, but nowadays it's not very valid, uh, except uh, through virtual reality, I'm sure. But no, that's okay. We have more than 20 coaches, and you can take half a year or something to live and um, just embed yourself in that particular culture. Yeah. Uh, I also saw that you are in a talk, then the, 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 the people ask you about what's the meaning of life. And also, mm -hmm. then I also saw this one question about how you deal with stress. So mm -hmm. I think particularly in the internet world that everything is so mm -hmm. uh, fast pacing. So mm -hmm. how will you give any tips for mm -hmm. all the Google about how you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the meaning of life, of course, is 42. Everybody knows about it. Uh, okay, so I'm sure you know about it. So uh, anyway, uh, so how do I deal with stress? Um, well, after all, during daytime, uh, I'm just having fun. Uh, and so whenever I see something that makes me stressful, uh, I will just um, play some synthetic music, um, computer generated, uh, and that associate this uh, stressful visual stimuli with a relaxing auditory stimuli. Or if I hear something stressful, then maybe I'll just make some tea, uh, throwing two random tea bags into the same drink and therefore creating a new pleasant flavor to associate with the stressful auditory stimuli. Uh, and if I smell something unpleasant, uh, then I, I don't know, maybe I'll just uh, go and check out a painting or something. So anyway, the point here is that uh, if you have uh, in your mind uh, sufficient capacity to invite the stimuli in without over identifying with that, which by the way, is very difficult to do with a touch screen, which is why I stay away from touch screens, then you can always balance it with other stimuli and then just synthesize that in your sleep. And if you sleep well that night, you will wake up reassociating that particular unpleasant stimuli with the long-term memory of that pleasant stimuli. And then the crystal ball in your uh, mind uh, will be colored again yellow. I think that's a really, really cool <laughs> perspective. Uh, another one is also about, uh, because uh, our, uh, Google culture, we also in encourage the diversity. So sometimes then we will have colleagues that have a different 
perspective and also opinions. And I, I know you in, in, in your environment and definitely you will also need to deal with a lot of different type of uh, diverse perspectives. So mm -hmm. how do you think that how we can build up a constructive confrontation culture and how you deal mm -hmm. with the people mm -hmm. have a different opinion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and it is a very, very short and simple answer. It's simply take all the sides. And that's just forwards. Uh, take all the sides. Uh, if people build uh, into the culture the capacity to empathize and take all the sides, like speaking personally, because I'm uh, born with a naturally low testosterone level, uh, I went through the male puberty uh, in my teens and the female puberty uh, in my tweens um, in early 20s. Uh, and so uh, I don't have in my mind this feeling that half of the people is different from me. Uh, to me, it's very easy to take all the signs. I started as a left-handed writer, but then I also learned to write with my right hand. So uh, I guess I can type faster. Uh, and, so, uh, and so again, it's just take all the signs. And, and if you think about Taiwan, really, Taiwan uh, caught between the Eurasian plate on one side uh, and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. There's endless earthquake and the earthquake warnings that's broadcasted by cell phone uh, broadcast. Uh, and that taught us not only to make our buildings resilient, but also our ideas resilient. When you can take both sides and you can survive the earthquake, the tension, uh, that means that the Jade Mountain, the Savia, the tip of Taiwan grows every year by two and a half centimeters. That's a geological fact, it's not a metaphor. Uh, and so that's what enabled the Taiwanese politics, instead of being caught by the left wing or the right wing, to grow skyward and take the upwing, if you will. That's really cool. And uh, I think that's another one which I also want to ask on behalf of Googler is because in our office, and we also have a lot of foreigner Googler, they work mm -hmm. in Taiwan. So how do you think that uh, Taiwan government can better help for the, the oldest for, foreign and have a better uh, environment in Taiwan? Uh, yeah, of course. You can check out Taiwan Gold Card. Uh, it's, a, it's a system uh, that we hand out just those gold cards, um, which are like three year, up to three year um, work permits, uh, life permits. Uh, you can get your family here. You can get a national health insurance uh, and therefore medical mask rations uh, and very easily after half a year. Uh, and you can check out the community at TaiwanGoldCard.com, uh, which by the way, is not made by our uh, foreign service or indeed any part of uh, Taiwan. It's made by um, Steve from YouTube, actually, one I think my our first go card holder, uh, and the other link that I uh, share with you, Taiwan can help that us uh, is also not made by the government. Uh, it's made by a bunch of YouTubers, um, and so yeah, YouTube founder and YouTubers, um, and you can learn about how the gold card works, uh, which is essentially if you're a digital nomad, uh, you can just just live in Taiwan uh, and doesn't have to get any certificate from any employer or anything like that. We just want you to hang out with us, and after you stay here for a while if you decide you like here. Um, actually, you can convert a visitor visa into a gold card uh, while you're uh, having a uh, you know tourism visit uh, to Taiwan. Many people did actually during the pandemic. And if you decide after a few years that you really like Taiwan, um, you can get uh, a citizenship without renouncing your original one. You can be also Taiwanese. Uh, my old professor, uh, Tim Len, uh, when I was studying in the NCCU without getting a degree, um, um, he used to have this weekly office hour with me, uh, recently decided uh, to be uh, a Taiwanese uh, citizen just based on this uh, Foreign Talent Act. Uh, and so feel free to be also Taiwanese uh, and enjoy our national health care. Okay. The, the last question is, some of Google asked you, uh, will you consider to open a YouTube channel by yourself because they they just enjoy today's dialogue so much and they want to uh, subscribe your channel and also learn more from you Will you okay, of course of course yeah uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, the public digital innovation space and it's actually part of my work uh, 
condition, like uh, any journalist, uh, any lobbyist, anyone that visits me must agree either to publish the transcript uh, to the Say It platform uh, that I maintain or to publish the entire recording uh, to the YouTube channel. So feel free to check out my daily work, day-to-day -day work. Um, and you can also be digital minister because in Taiwan, digital shu wei is the plural minister. So there's more than one way to do it. Thank you and live long and prosper. Yeah, and thanks for today your sharing. And I also want to, on behalf of the Google to say a big thank you for your precious time to engage with us. And also a lot of Google reach out to me and also ask me want to deliver their own gift to you. So I will collect all and then package it and, and deliver to you uh, and to say our big thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, live long again and prosper. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for thanks, thanks for all you tuning today. Bye. Bye.